now to this event. Um, my name is Avenue Bell, by the way. I'm the president for the GW Cyber Law Students Association. And I just want to thank everyone for coming. I think it's going to be a great discussion um, to talk about this proposed merger of AT&T T-Mobile. AT&T announced that it was going to try to acquire T-Mobile back in March of this year. And since then, there's been a lot of kind of buzz about this proposed transaction in terms of not only from the antitrust perspective, but also from the telecom perspective. What does this mean for the market? You know, is this competitive? Is this good for the public interest and consumers overall? So. We're just going to have, we have a lovely panel of distinguished ex experts in both antitrust and telecommunications law. So they're just going to give us some information about this, kind of discuss some of the issues, and then, well, I'm going to pose some questions to them, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for you guys to ask any questions that you have. So I want to thank you all for coming. We got a good turnout, and I really appreciate it. So now I'm just going to turn to our panelists and just give them a few minutes to introduce themselves and kind of say who they are and a little bit about what they're going to be talking about today. And you just need this to one turn is fine? this one on. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, does that work? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Natalie Roisman. I'm a partner at a law firm called Wilkinson Barker Nauer, which is a communications boutique here in D.C. I'm also an adjunct professor here at the law school. I see a couple of you who I know from class and certainly hope I'll see uh, some others of you in class this spring. Uh, it's the telecommuni Developments in Telecommunications Law and Policy course. Um, so in that class where we uh, breeze very, very quickly uh, through sort of a survey of the FCC, one of the things that we discuss um, are elements of the FCC's merger review authority and the way that the FCC can use that process to develop new policies and enforcement. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about that today, uh, about how the process works at the FCC, where the FCC's authority comes from, what makes the FCC's approach different from the Department of Justice, or not in the case of this transaction, but uh, more generally from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, also, some of the personalities and politics at the FCC, which is part of what I think makes this area pretty fun. Um, you know, one of the elements that we focus on in class and that I'll focus on today is distinguishing between what the statute or the rules say that the agency can do versus what actually happens in practice, sort of a behind the scenes kind of thing. Um, I do want to say, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, first and foremost, I'm a practitioner, and I do have some clients that are um, pretty interested in this transaction. And so as a result, I'll talk heavily about process today. I won't really talk about the merits of any of the party's arguments or opine on what um, will happen at the FCC. I can give you some ideas of the different things that could happen, but I'm not going to be able to answer questions about what I think will happen. Um, and the last thing I, I'll say before I, I pass this along is, is just to say, why are we even talking about the FCC today? Sort of what's the hook um, to get you, get you thinking? And, and uh, I'm sure most of you know or have thought about this, but you know, AT&T obviously wants to acquire T-Mobile. And what T-Mobile holds that is most valuable to AT&T are spectrum licenses, uh, licenses from the government that give them the right to use certain uh, radio frequency spectrum. And um, so AT&T is asking the FCC for permission to acquire those licenses um, from Deutsche Telekom, who is the current parent of T-Mobile. And we'll talk about this in much more detail later, but it's the involvement of those licenses that sort of subject this whole transaction to FCC approval. My name is Tom Morgan. Uh, I teach uh, antitrust uh, and uh, professional responsibility here at the law school. Uh, I have no direct connection with this transaction at all. I don't practice uh, antitrust law uh, or professional responsibility. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that makes two of us, Tom. Uh, so I uh, so I can be an expert in, <laughs> in both fields. Uh, I uh, uh, will be talking about the uh, Justice Department case and uh, trying to uh, describe what, uh, what the burden is the Justice Department has. Uh, I think you'll learn a lot from uh, our other uh, panelists about uh, uh, more of the substance of the argument, but I'll try to uh, uh, jump in there too when uh, I have something to add. Hi, I'm Sherwin C., Deputy Legal Director at Public Knowledge. We're a uh, nonprofit public interest group based here in D.C., and we're concerned with ensuring a, a free and open Internet. Now, 
that makes uh, that means we're concerned with making sure that uh, that communications on the internet aren't going to be overly constrained either by uh, the injudicious application of copyright law or the uh, interference by uh, telecommunications companies or other intermediaries in the middle. Uh, so we've been uh, we've been advocating strenuously in opposition to this merger. Uh, I think that. Uh, what we'll end up talking about is a, a great deal about what's in the law for the standards for the Department of Justice to bring their suit to, to stop the merger under the Clayton Act. Uh, what's, what's at stake for the FCC and, and their responsibility to ensure competition in the marketplace? There's also, if you've been following this merger or news of this merger in, in sort of the general media, there will be a, a huge swath of arguments going back and forth about jobs, about uh, the ability to build out and investment and this and that. Uh, I think, you know, those are really interesting policy questions. They don't necessarily impact directly upon the legal questions here, but I think that's, there's enough uh, for a lively discussion about those two. Uh, I'm Baron Soka. Uh, I'm president of Tech Freedom. Um, that's us. Uh, we're also a public interest uh, think tank. Um, we, I would say, have a fairly similar mission statement in the sense of being also in favor of a free and open internet. And we work with public knowledge on a number of issues. We're currently uh, jointly going in on a, a joint brief in the Supreme Court's uh, case challenging the FCC's uh, indecency rules, so we both oppose censorship. Uh, we're also both concerned about, um, as Sherwin put it, the injudicious application of copyright law, something that my colleague and your classmate Ryan Radia here is also an expert on that I work with at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. But uh, having said all of that, we have pretty different views about, um, about competition and antitrust and about what the real threats are. And in a nutshell, uh, we tend to be, I, I think it's fair to say, more uh, confident and optimistic in the markets and technological change to um, unseat incumbents, no matter how mighty they might seem, and to limit corporate power. Um, and we tend to be, to be more concerned about government power and more concerned about um, error costs, which is a way of saying that we think that government, uh, generally speaking, um, tends to get things wrong when it intervenes uh, in cases like this and that markets tend to do a better job of um, dealing with these concerns. They're not perfect. We don't believe markets never fail. But our message is that uh, government failure is, generally speaking, worse than market failure. And if you're going to make a case for intervention, you have to be very, very clear about what the government uh, interest is, uh, what harm you're trying to remedy, and why you think that government intervention will do a better job um, in, uh, once you understand the, the error costs uh, that are inherent in, in regulatory decision making, uh, that why you think that, that government, even under those limitations, will do a better job at intervening in a rapidly changing marketplace. And so I would just conclude by saying that um, in particular, uh, you'll hear a lot of us here talking today about the fact that there is a, there's a dual review process going on here. Uh, and we think that's um, largely a waste of everyone's time and money. Uh, I personally think that if we're going to review mergers like this, it should be on the basis of antitrust law. Antitrust law has what in the law we like to have, which is standards. Um, that you can, I mean, it's actually it's the law, right? It's like the, the law says something, and you have a way of measuring it. And that standard is consumer welfare, and we have econometric toolkits for uh, analyzing that. I tend to be pretty skeptical even about antitrust, but at least we understand what we're talking about, and we can make some intelligent decisions. By contrast, the FCC is, quite frankly, completely adrift with its public interest standard, which is not a standard at all. It doesn't mean anything. Um, insofar as it is distinct from a, a, an assessment of uh, A, consumer welfare, which is what antitrust is about, and B, the statutes that the FCC already enforces about specific things. So that's a way of saying that here my concern, as is generally the case in merger review, is that the, uh, the FCC is going to go off and basically regulate through the merger review process in ways that it would not otherwise have the authority to do and um, without being subject to the normal standards of review and judicial scrutiny that, it's, that every agency is supposed to follow. So um, thank you guys for that brief introduc introduction. So now we're just going to kind of have Natalie start off. And 
I would just want you to talk a bit about, I think there's been a lot of discussion about kind of AT&T and with the AT&T T-Bone book about the Department of Justice, the antitrust perspective. I think most people probably don't really understand what role the FCC plays, if at all, how their process works. So if you could kind of talk about what the standard is for the FCC, Barron kind of mentioned his concerns with their public interest standard. So if you could just talk about how that works, how the FCC goes through their process, where all law students kind of get an understanding of what the legal standard is for that for that particular aspect of the merger review. Sure. Well, uh, you know, for better or for worse, Baron, we're not going to solve your problems here uh, tonight. <laughs> so um, while it may well be the case that uh, the FCC is adrift, I think you said, and uh, that the public interest standard is, is totally a non-standard, um, let's pretend for now um, that the FCC uh, is not entirely adrift and has some sort of standard since it appears that they actually have this transaction in front of them. <laughs> Um, so I, I thought it'd be helpful for those of you who, as Avenue points out, might not have as much familiarity with the FCC, to start off by talking about sort of what is the FCC and, and who are the commissioners on the FCC, uh, because it's different from the Department of Justice. The FCC is not an executive branch agency. It's considered to be an independent agency. Uh, it, although the chairman is appointed by the president, uh, there's five commissioners that sit on the FCC. Three of them are from the party of the president. The other two are from the other party. So um, typically, if with a Democratic president in the White House, you'd have three Democrats and two Republicans. Right now, there's actually only four commissioners um, sitting on the FCC. And in fact, probably sometime between now and the end of the year, we'll lose one of those uh, whose term is expiring or actually has long expired and now he really has to leave. And um, we'll end up with three commissioners, which is not quite what the FCC is really supposed to look like, especially when it has a major transaction in front of it. Um, so as an independent agency, the FCC is really governed by its authorizing statute, and, and I brought this with me because I'm a regulatory lawyer and that's what I do. Uh, this is the Communications Act of 1934 as amended over many long years. Um, and this is where the FCC's authority comes from. There's a few other statutes uh, where the FCC has authority to do something, but as a general matter, pretty much everything that the FCC is allowed to do, mergers and otherwise, comes from here. Um, at the FCC, business is conducted by a majority vote, but the agenda is controlled by the chairman. And so for something like a, a transaction, what that means is um, the pace of the transaction review moves along as it's dictated by the FCC chairman. And it will come up for a vote or not come up for a vote before the full commission when the chairman of the FCC decides that it's time for that to happen and, and not before. And interestingly, um, this will be the second big transaction under the current chairman, uh, Chairman Janikowski. As some of you may remember, the Comcast NBCU transaction was approved earlier this year, and, and that was clearly a very large uh, transaction. And Surely we could have some other discussion on that. <laughs> um, but this is a pretty big deal you know, for, for one chairman to have uh, two major mergers of this size in front of him. Um, so importantly, the Communications Act is entirely separate from any of the antitrust laws. There's a competition element to a lot of things that the FCC does, but it doesn't bear any relation to the statutes that underlie uh, what the DOJ can do in the case of a merger. There's a particular statutory provision, Section 310D of the Act, and it provides that no spectrum license shall be transferred, assigned, or disposed of in any manner except upon application to the Commission and, this is important, upon finding by the FCC that the public interest, convenience, and necessity will be served thereby. Okay, so there's a couple of important things there, right? The first is we're talking about spectrum licenses. Now, there are other types of transactions where sometimes the FCC has a hook, but primarily we're talking about spectrum. Um, and here we have, obviously, a, a vast number of wireless licenses in place, so it fits squarely within the FCC's authority. Um, upon application to the Commission and upon finding by the FCC. So the FCC has to affirmatively approve the transaction. This makes it different from the role that the Department of Justice has, and I'm sure Tom will talk a little bit more specifically about what that is. So that means that if you're AT&T and T-Mobile in this case, irrespective of what uh, DOJ you know, might have decided to do, you would not be able to consummate the transaction absent FCC approval. Um, what's the other key phrase in here? Public interest. So Barron mentioned that's kind of a non, an unhelpful phrase. Doesn't tell us very much about what the FCC is supposed to be doing. They're supposed to review an application and find that it, the public interest, convenience, and necessity will be served if they grant the application to assign or transfer a license. 
There's no statutory time frame for the FCC's action. The statute doesn't say to the FCC, you've got to make an affirmative finding or, or you know, a non-affirmative finding within a certain number of days. This could languish you know, forever. What the FCC has done is it created this 180-day shot clock, but it doesn't follow it. Or when it wants to pretend to follow it, it just sort of stops the clock. Like it says to the parties, oh, we don't have enough information. Maybe you could give us some more information. We're stopping the clock. So then the parties have to get the information together, and they give it back to the FCC, and the FCC looks at it and sees if everything is there. And then they'll say, okay, well, now we'll restart the clock. And then they might stop the clock again. So the clock isn't really a very helpful metric. Um, how does the process work? The parties come in, and they file applications. Um, there is actually an application filed for every single license that's going to be transferred. So we're talking about markets across the U.S. and in some of those markets, multiple licenses. But what happens is that they write a single sort of public interest statement, and that's kind of the argument of the case, setting forth what are the benefits of the transaction um, and you know why it doesn't violate any rules or laws. And in this case, that um, entire application is about 700 pages long. The public interest statement is 100 and some pages of that followed by several appendices. So it's not a short uh, discussion. And AT&T and T-Mobile filed that uh, on April 21st of this year. And the process at the FCC is that once an application like that is filed, the FCC will assemble an interbureau team um, to review the transaction. So in this case, they'll have people who are from the Wireless Bureau. They might also have people who are from the Wireline Competition Bureau because even though this is a wireless deal, it could have uh, impact on, on wireline telephony issues. Um, they'll have people from the Office of General Counsel, from the Office of Strategic Planning, and from other sort of aspects within the within the agency. And um, Chairman Janikowski has done something that's different from what prior chairmen have done, which is to also uh, appoint a special counsel to lead the transaction review for each of the large transactions that's been in front of him. So there was one for Comcast NBCU, and then he appointed a, a particular special counsel for this transaction. Um, what the commission then does once it has the application in hand is it establishes a pleading cycle for the filing of public comments. And there's three pieces to that. Um, Parties can file petitions to deny the application. Then the applicants can file oppositions to the petitions to deny. And then the other parties can file replies to the oppositions to petitions to deny. And at that point, the pleading cycle officially closes, but that doesn't actually mean that people stop going in to talk to the FCC. Now, when you have a small transaction, like if I have a radio station and I want to sell it to you, um, we file an application to make that happen, and the FCC treats that as what's called a restricted proceeding, which means I'm not going to call up the FCC and talk about it. You're not going to call up the FCC and talk about it. If we have something we want to tell them, we'll put it in writing, um, or we have to both go in and sort of talk to them together about it. But with large transactions, what the FCC does is it makes them permit but disclose transactions. And what that says is you can come in and you can talk to anybody at the FCC about anything related to the transaction just as long as you put on the record the fact that you've done it. So what ends up happening um, you know, in reality is that although the comment cycle closes, the deal doesn't really start to get interesting at the FCC until after that when people go in and have meetings and file sort of dueling ex partes, some of which are longer than any of the comments or petitions that have been filed. And, and that's where you really... Um, if you're sort of a spectator to this, start to see the shape of the FCC's review developing. Because you can look at the public record and you can see who has come in and who have they met with and what have they said and what are the issues that are being teed up. And you can start to see the shape of where the FCC's primary uh, interest lies. Um, over the course of the transaction, the FCC often asks for additional information, reports, analysis. Um, you know, if you are a party to one of these transactions, if you're one of the applicants, you know, on, on any given day, the staff could call up and could say, you know what, it would be extremely helpful to us if you would run, you know, X, Y, and Z market analysis, and we really would be glad to have that soon. Um, and then you sort of have to run around and, and make that happen. Um, importantly, and I, I'm guessing that Tom is going to talk in some more detail about um, the the particular competition sort of review that um, that DOJ does. So the FCC does something that's similar, but uh, that is disparagingly or often disparagingly referred to as sort of antitrust light, right? It's uh, 
ostensibly uses some of the same standards and guidelines that the DOJ applies, but in a somewhat more relaxed manner. And then importantly, the FCC is not limited to those issues. So the FCC finds you know, competition to be an important part of its public interest analysis, but the public interest analysis isn't limited to that. And I mean, public interest is really as broad and as vague as it sounds. It could mean jobs. It could mean um, you know, people having access to different kinds of handsets. It it could mean better, faster service and fewer dropped calls. Um, you know, it could mean pretty much anything under the sun, and that's why the FCC's process gets really, really interesting. Uh, the, two more things that I just wanted to point out. The first one is something called a spectrum screen. So this is uh, particular to wireless transactions before the FCC. In any particular market, um, there's what's called a screen, sort of a threshold for a particular amount of spectrum that a party is seeking to hold in that market. Um, and for those of you who aren't too familiar with the concept of spectrum, I don't want to dig too deeply here, but we measure it in terms of megahertz, and you can think of it just sort of as a, as a chunk. And I'll use a pizza as an example. So if the screen were three pieces of pizza, and right now you have two pieces of pizza, but what you want to have is four pieces of pizza, now you've triggered that screen of the threshold three pieces, and the FCC has to look more closely at that particular market. It doesn't mean that they're going to say no, it just requires a closer look, and that's sort of how the screen operates. Um, and then last, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more in a little bit, um, what can the FCC do? Right? Well, the FCC has three options, really. The first one is they can approve a deal as it comes to them. Hey, you've got a proposed transaction. Looks good to us. We say, OK. A deal of this magnitude? Never. A deal of the magnitude of Comcast NBC? Never. Just not going to happen. Because even if there weren't anything um, sort of troubling about it on its face, the FCC is never going to pass up an opportunity to do something clever and creative and headline grabbing uh, in terms of something that they can wrangle you know, out of the parties. Um, so, so one option is to approve it as proposed, but you can sort of knock that off. The next option is to approve it with what we call conditions. So the FCC uh, kind of works with the parties to develop a list of quote unquote voluntary uh, conditions where the parties, <laughs> I'm sure you love that, Baron, uh, where the parties will say, well, we will do uh, X, Y, and Z things. And the commission says, this is so great. The applicant said that they would do X, Y, and Z. And we think that with that, that the transaction will meet the public interest, so we approve it. Um, and then the last option is to designate it for hearing. And that most times effectively kills a deal. It's not technically denying the applications, but it's setting the uh, the transaction up for a hearing before an administrative law judge, and that's just not something that the parties will usually continue to pursue. So the transaction right now before the FCC hasn't gotten to that stage. Um, the pleading cycle is closed. Um, obviously, you know, people are going and talking to the commission about the deal, um, but we have had no final resolution from the FCC. I just ask, a, as a procedural matter, are we going to cover the FCC first, or are we going down to DOJ? We're going to go to DOJ, just to kind of do process of both aspects, and then. Okay. Well, it, if it, it's process, though. Yeah, there might I might might make more sense to talk about some of the FCC process stuff before we shift gears to the DOJ. Okay. If a few minutes. My colleagues don't mind. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, cause I, I have a few things I want to say. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't want to jump anybody else who wants to add something. But let, let me just, so, so I think this is exactly right, that what you heard here at the end is what the deal really comes down to. So there's sort of two big issues here. The first is, at least, it doesn't actually really matter, but just so you know, there's this question of what the standard of review is. And the standard of review, basically, there is no standard. The standard is just, you know, you please the chairman, and you get two more votes on the commission, you get the deal through. So that's you know that's the cold reality. I think that's very sad, um, but but the, but so so what actually matters is, and this is this is I think the point of what you just heard, is the voluntary conditions, and just so everybody understands uh, exactly how grossly that has been abused, that was used that that process was used for example in the XM Sirius case uh, Sirius case so that the companies were not able to get their deal through, right? So they, they are struggling uh, in competing with internet uh, radio. The two companies are having a very difficult time. And after having been stuck in the approval process for I think it was 450 days, I'd have to go back and check exactly how long that was, the companies realized that what was actually holding up the deal was that the Congressional Black Caucus and other members of Congress were upset that there wasn't going to be enough uh, minority programming on satellite radio. So they agreed to a voluntary 
race-based set-aside of programming capacity. Now, had the FCC mandated that, that would have been grossly unconstitutional. <laughs> but they didn't mandate it. It was voluntary, right? So I, I bring up, this, this is just one, this is the tip of the iceberg. This happens all the time. And I just want to share with you, because to me, this is the most important point about this conversation. That this, this is not just me saying this. This debate has been going on for many years. And if you're interested in this subject, I would encourage you to go read the excellent work of Commissioner Harold Furchgott Roth, who, uh, as, um, as early as 1999, was writing stinging dissents and uh, separate statements about this at the FCC. And I would commend to you most of all his, his separate statement approving the SBC Ameritech deal, where the commission imposed um, 30 conditions on the deal that essentially became the regulatory framework for uh, governing how, how voice services were going to be provisioned in this country. And he writes, and I think very eloquently, and says, the use of voluntary standards allows administrative agencies better to skirt statutory limits on their authority, which is an offense to the concept of administrative agencies in possession of only those powers delegated to them by Congress. It is no coincidence that the commitments extracted from regula regulated entities in the guise of voluntary standards tend to be things the agency lacks statutory authority straightforwardly to require, like unconstitutional race-based set-asides, for example. Voluntary standards, as opposed to duly promulgated rules, can all too easily be used to bootstrap jurisdictional issues, got uh, jurisdiction to be approved, uh, to approve or disapprove the transfer of licenses, but no, no express statutory authority to the license trans transfer, add water, mix, and you have fresh jurisdiction to regulate a whole new area. The problem with this approach is that it renders superfluous congressional attempts to delineate our areas of responsibility. So this was, you know, Commissioner uh, at the, the FCC. So my, my point in reciting all of this is to say that before we get into the substance of this deal and what you think about the AT&T T-Mobile deal, uh, merger in particular, everybody here who cares about, like, you know, the rule of law and due process and open government and all those things that we talk about in Washington should be horrified at the way that merger review is done. And it doesn't really matter what you think about mergers. You could be a big as bad kind of guy and still find this deeply disturbing. So I just, I want to submit that before we start getting into the separate conversation here about what you think about markets and competition. Well, and, I mean, I think that's, that's a fair criticism. I'm just not sure that that's sort of the topic of discussion here tonight. I think it's intellectually very interesting, and I certainly would also encourage um, folks who are interested to pursue that. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, the commission that we have right now is the commission that we have right now. Oh. It's chaired by someone who doesn't subscribe so, and it's to, you know, of the Commissioner first got Roth's philosophy. It's not just the question of the commission that we have right now. It's also a question of the statute that we have right now, which is, which does give the, the, the FCC this public interest standard, which, you know, is admittedly not as rigorous and, and not as, as clearly delineated as the antitrust standard. Well, it's not Neither one of those at all. But let me just let me briefly just say, my point in all of this is, if there are going to be conditions to the deal, and this is what what you'll find when you go back and read uh, Fritz Scott Roth's work and and this line of cases, it's not just a rant about the public interest standard. It's a way of saying, if there are going to be conditions to the deal, they have to be related to actual problems in the marketplace. So so there has to be a clear nexus between those two things. And there's a line of cases that uh, first Scott Roth referred to. Uh, Justice Breyer, before he was put on the court, uh, ruled very eloquently. I think it was City of Boston uh, was a decision about how there has to be a nexus between regulatory activity uh, and, and problems. So that's a way of saying that the FCC really doesn't, well, when I say that, they, that, they, that there is no standard here, I do mean that, but, but there are legal boundaries that cabin their authority. And so the FCC does have to function within those. And, and I would hope that we would find more you know, court challenges uh, to them. But, but the problem with this, this case law is that, the, as you've already heard, these things drag on so long that by the time that this, this is already done, the parties just want to walk away from the deal. They don't want to deal with it anymore, and they don't want to fight. And that's why the case law isn't well developed. So my point is, Let's focus on real problems and find conditions to fix them. Well, I, I think we've, but I think one of the problems here is you, you've got a couple of arguments that sort of are come before uh, that that sort of are at a level of abstraction above what we're dealing with here, which is you know what is the proper role of, of the FCC and what should the Communications Act look like, and you've got some that 
I think, uh, that really aren't ripe yet for discussion, which is what should the conditions be? I think that the first question is whether or not the FCC should approve the license transfers. Right. Well, well the only reason I, I'm bringing this up now is that we, we, we thought it would be helpful to do this in sort of issue rule analysis conclusion format. In other words, to separate this process discussion very clearly from the merits of the case. So I've said my piece. I'll stop beating that horse. <laughs> but please, I want to let my colleagues continue. Okay, I just want to, uh, I know that, I don't know if, Sherwin, if you want, uh, did you have anything I mean, else no, to add think, regarding we can, that? We can get to, we'll, 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 well, I'm sure okay. we'll get to the substance a lot later. I just, you know, okay. defining exactly <laughs> what the issue is and, and, you know, the issue is, right? Because if you, if you did an Iraq, you know, memo and, <laughs> and combine three different issues in that first, in that first section, then you, 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 I, you know, I'd have problems with it. <laughs> okay, so. So we're not going to hang on that too much longer. We're going to go to Professor Morgan, and now we're just going to briefly go over the antitrust perspective of this. And then once we are th done with that, we can get into the substance of this merger. And I'm sure more process discussion will come up generally regarding merger review in general by both agencies. So Professor Morgan, if okay. you could just give a little background on kind of what's happening with the DOJ. I know they're pretty much much further along in their process than the FCC clearly is as they've already filed suit to block it. But if you kind of maybe just take a few steps back and like explain to us what the whole process was about. Okay. Uh, fortunately, my, uh, my topic has nothing to do with politics. There are no, uh, no political judgments uh, made uh, by the enforcement agencies. Uh, seriously, uh, I'm t what I'm talking about is a process in the U.S. Department of Justice, the same Department of Justice that prosecutes criminal cases, environmental cases, civil rights cases, and so on. This is just a uh, part of the Justice Department called the Antitrust Division that considers uh, uh, a variety of uh, potential violations of uh, the antitrust statutes. Uh, the, uh, they have criminal jurisdiction over uh, cases arising under the Sherman Act, uh, which deal primarily with cartels and monopolies. But what we're talking about is uh, the third large basis of antitrust division jurisdiction, uh, which is uh, enforcement of Section 7 of the Clayton Antitrust Law. Uh, Clayton Act was adopted in 1914 and regulates mergers. It regulates mergers in a whole variety of areas, so uh, there's nothing uh, unique about what the Justice Department's doing. Uh, that uh, because this uh, is uh, a case involving telecommunications, uh, it is a jurisdiction parallel to the FCC as distinguished from one in which the Justice Department would cede jurisdiction to the FCC or uh, uh, where the Justice Department's uh, decision would be uh, controlling on the, uh, the FCC. What Section 7 of the Clayton Act prohibits is um, the acquisition of stock or assets of a company by another company, quote, where in any line of commerce or in any section of the country, the effect of such acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly, end quote. That's the whole statute. Now, uh, unlike apparently the FCC, uh, the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission, which has a, a parallel jurisdiction, although they don't act in the same cases, they allocate these, uh, these processes, uh, they, uh, <coughs> they uh, issue what are called merger guidelines, which attempt to describe what their process is going to be. And I'll get to those standards in a couple minutes. But under the, uh, a separate statute called the hart scott Rodino Act, actually it's part of the antitrust laws, it's part of the Clayton Act now, it's uh, Section 7A of the Clayton Act, uh, firms must notify the Department of Justice and Federal Trade Commission when they're planning a merger. They have to notify them uh, at least 30 days prior to the time they plan to close the merger. Uh, if the uh, merger involves uh, acquiring uh, uh, over uh, $200 million in stock or assets, or if the sales of uh, the two companies, one of the two companies exceeds $100 million and the other exceeds $10 million, 
uh, those figures are trivial uh, compared to the assets involved here, which are in the billions. So uh, uh, clearly, this transaction had to be noticed to the uh, Justice Department, uh, and uh, it was uh, in March, I guess, uh, or before. And for over six months, uh, the, uh, uh, age, the department had before it the submissions of the uh, merging parties explaining what they were planning to do and why they thought it was lawful. And the Justice Department was able to ask them for more information uh, to, uh, to essentially uh, try to, uh, to learn more about the transaction and have the parties to the transaction explain to the Justice Department why it should go through. Uh, it's interesting to me that it, uh, it was pending as long as it was. Uh, it suggests that there are uh, some, some substantial issues uh, that the Justice Department saw. That is to say that they were not, they didn't immediately move to enjoin it. Uh, and uh, there was a, a substantial discussion of it, uh, which culminated uh, in September, uh, I think it was, uh, the, with the filing of the uh, uh, action in the Federal District Court here in Washington to enjoin the merger. The standard uh, uh, is, uh, uh, as uh, we've said, uh, that uh, the government has to show, the Justice Department has to show, by a preponderance of the evidence, the uh, product market, which uh, you remember from the language of the statute, in any line of commerce that has become known just generally as the product market. And in any section of the country is what's called the geographic market. So uh, the Justice Department has the burden of proof to prove what those markets are, and then to prove that there has been a substantial lessening of competition or tendency to create a monopoly in uh, one or more of the markets uh, thus defined. Uh, the companies. Uh, have asked for an expedited hearing. Uh, I've, I'm not certain whether they've scheduled a date. I think there's a trial date scheduled in February now. Uh, I've, I've, I've lost track of exactly what it is. What is it? February 13th. February 13th, all right. Uh, that's close enough. Uh, and uh, they've, uh, there's a pending motion to appoint a uh, master who would take evidence prior to that uh, trial, apparently, and try to begin putting the record together. Because as everybody here has said, um, uh, and I think would agree, once you've decided to merge, uh, every day or at least every week or month uh, delay makes it less likely that the merger is going to go through or is going to be successful. Frequently these are financed uh, by outside sources. I think that's less true here. But uh, uh, so it's, it's important to the parties to get an answer in the case. Uh, there was presumably some negotiation that went on during this uh, uh, six, seven, eight month period uh, over uh, possible uh, alterations to the merger, things they might have done differently. Uh, but uh, uh, none of those uh, were required and uh, none of them were sufficient apparently to uh, uh, change the, uh, the government's mind. In a merger case, uh, under the merger guidelines, which as I say are uh, an announced policy, they're not technically rules in the sense of being binding uh, uh, authority, but they're a sort of self-regulation by the department. The department says that there are six essentially major issues. The first uh, is what is the definition of the relevant markets? Uh, what and the issue there is in deciding what a market is, is what do people see as effective substitutes for the products produced by these parties or the, the products that are affected by the merger? Uh, just to jump ahead, what the government has said is that the product market is mobile wireless telecommunication. Uh, that is the, the chosen definition where the government's going to take its stand. Uh, there'll be a question as to whether landlines are uh, a substitute for mobile wireless telecommunication. Uh, 
and the question is, and it, well, there'll, there'll be a, there'll be a number of potential uh, possible substitutes, but that's uh, that's the product market they've chosen. The geographic market they've chosen uh, is uh, uh, the top 100 cellular market areas in the United States. Uh, it's interesting. You can have a merger fail because in a single local jurisdiction in the United States, uh, there is an adverse effect on competition or tendency to create a monopoly. In this, and sometimes the negotiations that take place would say, well, we just won't merge in the one bad one. Uh, but uh, in this case, the effects are sufficiently similar across the country that I suspect that there really wasn't, didn't turn out to be a basis for that kind of more limited uh, settlement. The second basic question is, does the merger significantly increase concentration in the relevant markets? Uh, that basically means, uh, are there, uh, are there fewer uh, uh, players? There obviously is some uh, uh, reduction in the number of players when you merge two of them. But uh, if you had 100 firms uh, and you merged two of them, so there are, only, there are 99 left, uh, there's probably not going to be a substantial lessening of competition or even tendency to create a monopoly. Uh, and so you measure that in this or any other case by what's called the uh, herfindahl hirschman Index, or HHI, uh, which is uh, uh, calculated by squaring the market share of each of the parties, adding those together, uh, and uh, that gives you the post-merger HHI. Uh, in this case, uh, the HHIs in most of these 100 markets are uh, over 3,000. <laughs> And the increase in the HHI is over 500. Under the merger guidelines, uh, if it's over 2,500 and the increase over 200, there is a presumption that the merger substantial, uh, inc substantially increases concentration. Uh, so that I don't think is, uh, assuming the markets are, are accepted, that isn't likely to be a contested issue. Um, the third, however, may well be and that is what is the effect on competition as a result of the increase in concentration. Back in the, uh, uh, what uh, some of us would consider the bad old days, uh, a, uh, an increase in concentration alone was viewed as uh, a basis for saying, well, there must be something wrong if we've got more concentration. Now you have to have some theories as to why there's a link between the fact that these companies have a large share of the market and that there's going to be a lessening of competition, that there isn't just kind of inherent competition in this area. The argument of the Justice Department is that when you go from four firms in the industry, which we basically have today, to three, it's going to be significantly easier for them to coordinate their activities to uh, engage in oligopoly pricing uh, or oligopoly practices. Um, you can ask yourself whether it's going to be that much easier with three than, than it was with four. Although the government's theory there is that T-Mobile has always been the kind of, um, what, uh, a disruptive uh, firm on the edge that has uh, uh, lowered prices, come in with attractive new plans, and that the loss of that is what's going to, uh, they, they were ones that were hard to coordinate, uh, and that the loss of T-Mobile is going to make it easier for coordination to occur. The, they also argue that there will be what are called unilateral effects. That is that people who used to want competition uh, from AT&T would go to T-Mobile, not to Verizon or to Sprint. And T-Mobile, and similarly, if you leave T-Mobile, you go to AT&T. Now those people won't have an escape. So those are what are called unilateral effects. And third, uh, uh, the uh, uh, argument is uh, that uh, there's going to be a reduction in innovation. That comes back to this idea that uh, there were four people trying to create new uh, uh, ways of doing things in the industry, and now we're down to three. Uh, the fourth issue 
is even if you do have these adverse effects on competition created by the increase in concentration, is the industry one in which new uh, developments, uh, new entry uh, uh, is likely to correct any problems that this merger would create? That is, can you look at this world and say, uh, we just don't need the uh, uh, error costs uh, that uh, were described earlier, uh, that, that uh, intervention could create, uh, will, can we count on the market to correct things? The government says no, says this is an extremely expensive industry to enter, uh, you just can't uh, expect uh, that to happen here. Uh, fifth, uh, the issue is uh, even if you have all these problems and you aren't going to correct them in the market, uh, are there merger-related efficiencies that the mergers create that will uh, create more public benefits than the adverse effects will create public harm? Uh, and that is, uh, is yet another escape valve. The government says no. There aren't merger-related efficiencies from what we've seen in the press. Uh, this is where the, we're going to have more jobs, we're going to bring more back to this country. Some of these arguments would fit uh, under there. Uh, sixth is the question, would one of the firms have failed? Uh, that is, gone out of business anyway, so that at the end of the day, we'd have three companies. And we have three companies with the merger, but you're not going to be any better off uh, if you uh, uh, prevent the, uh, the merger, because one of them is going to fail anyway. Government says no, that wouldn't happen. None of these firms are in financial trouble. Uh, at least what we read uh, is that uh, uh, some of the, part of the argument is that T-Mobile was going to get out of the market anyway. Uh, they don't like doing business here. Deutsche Telekom wants to go back to Europe. Uh, and uh, it'll be a, it's an interesting feature of this case to ask whether uh, that argument, which isn't recognized under the merger guidelines, could nevertheless be recognized here. But that's an overview at least, uh, maybe more of a detail than you wanted. But the point is, to the Justice Department, this is a garden variety merger case. I don't mean it's a garden variety in the sense that they're indifferent. Uh, they argue that this is one of the most important industries in the country. Uh, they talk about the development, uh, the, everything, the iPad, uh, 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 the, uh, the whole variety of, uh, of communications devices that are driven by um, this, uh, uh, this industry. Uh, so they recognize it's important, but the manner in which they analyze it and defend whatever position uh, uh, they bring before the court will be the same kind of, of analysis that they would use uh, in any significant merger. Thank you. So um, just so that we kind of, I'm sure everyone wants to get to the, the juicy part or get to the substance of this particular transaction, I'm just going to spend maybe five minutes finishing out the process section. I know we had, so one of the things that has come up is the fact that members of Congress have been commenting on this a lot. And I thought maybe, Sherwin, you could just spend some time kind of telling us what is the role of Congress in a transaction of this at all, if at all? Like, do they have any power? Can they do anything? Uh, regarding minimal, it? if at all. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, just basically, you know, there, there are people lobbying Congress heavily. It's, uh, you know, on, on both sides of this issue. But the, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, what Congress's sort of legal authority is is, is not really sort of invested in these in this litigation. It's really a matter of, of Congress being a, a, bu a bully pulpit. Uh, and uh, there's, there's, you know, arguments about how many jobs the merger will create or destroy uh, are ones aimed, you know, at, at sort of the, the heart uh, of a congressman, but it's not at the heart of whether or not you're going to see a lessening in competition or a tendency to monopolization. So I think uh, that's, I think it's, it's important to recognize that, that you're going to see a lot of these arguments, and a lot of them might just, you know, are interesting policy arguments, and I think that they actually, you know, for the vast majority of them, weigh against uh, granting the merger. But in the end, the question of how they interact with this, this law enforcement action by the Department of Justice is, you know, it's, it's, it's legally minimal. 
Uh, briefly, I, I agree with Sherwin that uh, jobs are irrelevant. In fact, uh, it used to be the case that you justified a merger by pointing out that the combined company would, would be more efficient, and that often, in fact, generally meant that you lay off people because they were redundant. But what this really demonstrates is that, that in fact, this is about political theater. So my goal here tonight, as it generally my goal and what I do, is to shatter people's illusions. And the illusion that most people in this town, I'm sorry to say, are living under is that we, um, that we actually have a meaningful rule of law in this country. And if you want a good example of why we don't, I'll just point you to um, when WikiLeaks, remember that example when WikiLeaks broke, uh, Joe Lieberman uh, simply made a phone call to Amazon and said, you don't really want to host WikiLeaks servers, right? You don't really want to do that. He was using his bully pulpit, but they had any legal authority. There was no law they were violating. But Amazon caved. Amazon uh, stopped hosting, and there were similar uh, efforts made to intimidate uh, payment processors. And the point of that example is that in this case, uh, as in much of what happens in Washington, people in Congress, uh, yes, they have no legal bearing on anything, but that doesn't really matter because a lot of this is not about the law. It's about political theater. And, and they do have consequences in the way that these mergers uh, work out. And as I mentioned in the example of the Sirius XM deal, those clearly unconstitutional conditions were imposed because the Congressional Black Caucus at the time was adamant that they would, they would, they would not allow the merger to go through, and they were deeply opposed to it. And so I would only add to all of this that let's keep in mind here that um, while the antitrust laws do actually have a firm basis in law and have actual econometric standards, that doesn't mean anything if a president decides or his Department of Justice decides that, uh, for example, here, hypothetically, um, that their base uh, is pissed off at them for not doing enough about things like net neutrality and that they need to make a strong showing to keep those people happy before the election. And so, quite frankly, that plays a large part in all of these, uh, these decisions. So just because the DOJ has brought a case here doesn't actually mean that the DOJ's own standards and guidelines and the things that the DOJ, which I want to talk about later, has said to the FCC in the past about how to measure markets act, would actually indicate that there's a problem here. Okay. Um, so now to get to the substance of this particular transaction, we've talked a lot about kind of the process from the different agencies and how Congress might, might or might not play a role in this. But I know one of the things Professor Morgan mentioned within the context of the DOJ review is this aspect of the markets. And I think there was some dispute about how you define the market. So I thought I would give each of you, Barron and Sherwin, maybe a few minutes to kind of maybe talk about whether, if you agree or not, I'm not particularly sure, on how would you define the market in this particular transaction? And do you think that the DOJ's definition of the market is a fair assessment? No. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. Um, uh, so uh, we're taking just market definition for now. Okay, so just, just market definition. So, um, you know, uh, I would point everybody here, uh, the National Broadband Plan has been the best thing that this FCC has produced. It was a really good explanation of, of the, the spectrum crisis that we're facing. Um, and, and it's good in the sense that it diagnoses the problem and it points out that we have this enormous shortage of spectrum. The government has horribly mismanaged both the allocation of spectrum uh, and also the availability uh, at, at the level of local government of tower sightings and other resources that you need to build out a wireless network. And so the, the main thrust of that national broadband plan, as I took it, was there is this huge crisis. So that's the backdrop behind all of this. Now, at the same time, we have the FCC coming along here and the DOJ and saying that, um, that, th that they don't want to allow this particular merger. Uh, I think it would actually help to meet that uh, that broadband uh, need um, by providing an what part of definition would you like hold to on see? a second just so so what, what I want to point to here is so in the DOJ's letter about the national broadband plan they say that ultimately what matters for any given consumer is the set of broadband offerings available to that consumer including their technical characteristics and the commercial terms and conditions in which they are offered competitive conditions vary considerably for consumers in different geographic locales the point being that the FCC here, and also uh, in other parts of that letter, excuse me, the DOJ, um, the, in other parts of the letter, they, they explicitly reject simple reliance on HHIs. And they instead have a general focus on, on, on um, what I would take to be a more but dynamic that, that's assessment a question of, of concentration, market right? analysis. HHI is a question yeah, of concentration. Yeah, two different, two different points. So My, what market definition was the question? Yeah. 
Okay, so market definition is the question. So look, the, the, the first point to make here is uh, everyone has talked about there, there being four players in this market. Actually, there are six large nationwide uh, players. They have been excluded from the market, uh, I think, uh, speciously. First, because they primarily offer uh, prepaid services, the Metro PCS and uh, US Cellular. Um, and so they've just been written off uh, as if that's not a competitive pressure. I don't think there's a strong justification for doing that. And the second point is uh, they've been written off because uh, the claim is that people want you know, nationwide uh, resellers. Well, as far as I can tell, those companies actually uh, do offer meaningful nationwide service. If your concern was, for example, about roaming, and the ability to provide roaming in a specific area, that would be a merger-specific problem where we could talk about a specific remedy or condition that was designed to make sure that those other two competitors and other insurance would be able to provide roaming services. That would be the kind of analysis that I would look forward to, but it's not a reason for artificially uh, limiting the market in this sense uh, narrowly. Yeah, I'm just going to interrupt for one second. I'm not sure if everybody you know, fully knows what, what roaming is. Roaming is if, is if you don't have your own facilities, your own infrastructure, um, and one of your customers is looking to make a call somewhere that you actually have to roam uh, on somebody else's network. Right. Right. So the there's a very complicated sort of regime that governs uh, the ability of, of uh, customers from one company to roam on another company's and network. The vast majority of, of the facilities are going to be owned by the big four, if not mostly by AT&T and Verizon. Uh, and, and also, there's also the difference we want to draw between roaming in terms of wireless voice and wireless data, because those are going to be handled under different regimes. So those are all fair points, but, but, but none of that should be, should be dealt with in the market definition point. So my point, in a nutshell, is this is not a four to three merger. If anything, it's a six to five merger. But in fact, the more meaningful market definition here is not about, is about all of this stuff. It's about 4G, right? So I, my 4G tablet, I'm never going to buy another 4G phone. 4G, this is fat now faster than my home broadband service. This is the future. This is the market that matters. And then that market today is Verizon. So from my perspective, this merger is a one to two merger in the sense that by combining their assets of both Spectrum and tower sightings and other resources, AT&T and T-Mobile are able to offer a, a 4G service that is competitive with Verizon's, which they would not otherwise be able to do. So that's the sense in which I, I want to see a more dynamic uh, market analysis here. Well, I, I just, you know, you can't ignore the markets that are existing. The fact that, you know, I, I think we, I can ask how many, you know, how many wireless data, how many wireless voice customers we have in this room. I can ask how many 4G, how many LTE customers we have in this room. I mean, you, you, don't, you don't litigate with the market you want. You litigate the market you have. Uh, and... So, so, I mean, and the idea that you want to allow a merger so that you can create a new colossus to fight the existing behemoth <laughs> doesn't, 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 like, make a lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, in terms of defining markets and, you know, whether it's a question of six to five or uh, four to three, these are both still extremely concentrated markets. And secondly, if you're talking about you know, if you're defining what the products are, how those products are offered actually matters quite a bit. Whether or not a, um, a, uh, a national office supply chain is going to compete with a grocery store because they both sell stationary products, is, that's a valid question. How those things are offered, as opposed to just what the product themselves are, matter a very great deal in antitrust analysis. Yeah, I, I, would, I would only say um, that uh, the market, look, the problem with the antitrust law is that it moves so slowly. By the time that this case is actually working itself out next year, the percentage of people who are on 4G uh, plans will be quite a lot higher. And in another year, it's going to be most, I mean, I, I don't know exact, the exact projection, projections on rollout, but the point is, this is the market that matters. And, and if, your fo if your focus in antitrust is on the static snapshot of today, you will not meet antitrust goal of serving consumers, nor will you meet the FCC's so-called standard but how of serving the public But how are you going to have interest? more competitors by allowing a merger? You're, I, no, hang on, because, because the argument that I keep hearing is that basically, you know, AT&T is going to be completely unable to roll out a 4G uh, network unless it has this merger. Well, they already have plans to do this absent the actual acquisition of T-Mobile. And, and they actually have less, uh, they have more spectrum than Verizon does. And Verizon has actually invested 
in, in, in rolling out LTE. So they have less spectrum. Uh, uh, Verizon has less spectrum and more customers in which to do this. And yet they've done it. And, uh, and you know, there's no reason, I mean, there's no reason to believe that simply allowing a larger profit margin is going to get you the good things that a company is going to promise. You know, with a larger profit margin, uh, with a larger uh, you know, ability to, to gain revenues, they could hire more people, they could invest more, but there's no guarantee that this is going to happen. You know, and you talk about conditions. Is a con are conditions going to be good, long-lasting substitutes for an actual competitive marketplace? I don't think okay, so. Okay, so, so we're jumping ahead. Uh, we've, we've skipped past the market definition. We're jumping into the sort of analysis questions, which I'm happy to well, do. because if you're defining market definition, right, as, as 4G, we want, we want to be able to accurately define who are the players in the market. Yeah, and I'm saying we need to build more players. So, I mean, if you want to talk about concentration, I think this is where the conversation is going. Why are there, why is there, you know, why do you think that there aren't enough players? Is it just in the absence of this merger? You so know, so we're today, okay. Creating, uh, creating a market that, that isn't sort of competitive today in order to justify a merger. Yeah, because that's that's the, the whole point here, right? Is to is to, and this is the point of also Justice Breyer's decision, right? Is that antitrust goals, right, include promoting competition and innovation, right? That's what that's the point, right? So it's not it's not about <laughs> levels of concentration. Those are all proxies. They're ways of guessing what the impact is going to be on consumers. And the HHIs, which was you know have been around for a long time, may have made sense at a point when you were talking about grocery stores or other businesses like that. But I just I have to refer you to, to what the FCC, I'm sorry, the DOJ itself said in its letter to the FCC. Well, so you couldn't do any better than this. We do not find it especially helpful to define some abstract notion of whether or not a particular a broadband market is competitive. Such a dichotomy makes little sense in the presence of large economies of scale, which preclude having many small suppliers and thus often lead to oligopolistic market structures. The operative question in competition policy is whether there are market levers that can be used to produce superior outcomes, not whether the market resembles the textbook model of perfect competition. In highly concentrated markets, the policy levers often include merger control policies, limits on business practices, uh, policies that thwart innovation, e.g. by blocking interconnection, and public policies that affirmatively lower uh, entry barriers facing new entrants and new technologies, such as like fixing the problem with spectrum. The, the point here ab about this is the, the DOJ took this position during the National Broadband Plan, right, which would have led you to think that they were moving in a very smart way away from reliance on HHIs and away from this obsessive focus on levels of concentration and to a more dynamic understanding that what matters is the, the availability of new services and prices. And it would have led you to think that if you looked at prices in this marketplace, and if I if I'd done PowerPoint, if I had a graph, you basically see you have one line that shows levels of concentration. Baron, sorry, I, hate, going, I don't want to cut I just, you off. I want to make this just okay. brief point. Levels of concentration going way up in this industry over the last 10 years and prices going way down. So when you see those two things, you start to think, gee, maybe levels of concentration don't drive up price. And maybe there's more to this story. Well, and just getting back to the statute, right, the question of what happens to the price. And, and actually, I, I would wonder, relative to the amount of, of data usage and the amount of, uh, and what, you know, what these, uh, what the relative cost is, per person. I mean, you, you can have these arguments over where these numbers go and what the trends are. But the question under the Clayton Act is, you know, will this substantially lessen competition? It does. <laughs> OK, no. so I, I'm sorry. I don't. I, I hate to cut you off, but it's almost 7.15. And we want to try to, I, Professor Morgan, did you have something else you wanted to say? And then maybe you can open it up to the audience to get see if anyone has any questions. I have, and don't want to limit the discussion, but I also want to give everybody else a chance to participate. <laughs> I think Barron's making an important point uh, to understand that, uh, the, and this is the area where there really are political and uh, uh, policy judgments made uh, in deciding whether or not to file a case. Uh, it may well be that <clears throat> there is a decline in competition in one market or one uh, for one kind of product, but an increase in competition uh, look, looking at the market another way. The statute allows the Justice Department to 
challenge the merger where there's a substantial lessening of competition in any line of commerce in any section of the country. The classic case on this was the Philadelphia National Bank case where uh, they allowed a bank merger in Philadelphia that reduced the number of options uh, for consumers but was designed to increase competition in the market for lending to large corporations. And this was a policy judgment made uh, by the comptroller of the currency. The Justice Department, however, was permitted, uh, the Supreme Court upheld, a challenge where there was a decline in competition in a single market. The question is not so much whether the Justice Department, in short, could win this case, uh, without, uh, that is, they don't have to decide the issue that Barron's raising. But what he is saying, I think, is that it was a bad, or may have been a bad decision to file the case if you really do think that the intervention here, the prevention of the merger, which the Justice Department may be able to achieve under current law, would in fact impose costs and get in the way of the development of an industry that could develop much better uh, if the merger were permitted. There are policy judgments in short, even if you've got the legal authority to, uh, to do something. So I think that's helpful context. I just want to distinguish that, that that case is different here because that's two different markets with different customers, whereas I'm talking about people shifting from, it, 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 it's, if you want to call them separate markets, you could do that. It's really just a, a, a new form of service. It's innovation, right? So they're shifting from old forms of delivering broadband, very slow broadband, to ones that enable you to do far more uh, with the internet and to have the internet in a rich and robust way on your mobile device. Okay. I, and, Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so now I just, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I mean, we can go, okay. Um, just in terms of just kind of getting the market and the, what you have to find out how this is a unique market. I would say, what do you do with the practical concerns if you want to block the merger specifically, saying that T-Mobile, the company that owns T-Mobile, doesn't want it anymore. T-Mobile is losing money, and there's no really elsewhere to go. Verizon obviously can't buy it because Verizon's bigger than AT&T, so we've got the same problem to be worse. Sprint doesn't nearly have the money to buy it, even if it wanted to, so it can't do it. And then you're, the only other option that would be to break up T-Mobile into a bunch of smaller companies, but. That wouldn't, again, wouldn't do the job for the corporate owner of people that really just wants to get it off his books because it was a bad acquisition and let those back and walk a ton of money on it. So I would just say, if you do want to block in the interest of further competition, what do you do for just the pure corporate sense where you can't sell them to AT&T, you can't sell them anywhere else, well, what do you do with T-Mobile? Are you just going to let it sit there and just keep doing the money? Well, I mean, T-Mobile is a you know is a company that can that can stand on its own. I think, and you there's any number of people who could also come in uh, as buyers. I mean, there are uh, consortiums of cable companies and other you know existing sort of landline to left any providers who might be very interested in doing something like that. Uh, and you know, some of these smaller players uh, like Metro PCS might also be interested. It's not a foregone conclusion that T-Mobile is going to disappear. Yeah, I think there have been, been a lot of analyst reports talking about sort of what's the future of Timo if this deal doesn't go through. Um, you know, there had been some talks with Sprint. I think that the general consensus now seems to be that if, you know, AT&T T-Mobile doesn't work, that Sprint T-Mobile probably doesn't work either. Um, Dish Network is one of the companies that's been talked about. Maybe some kind of partnership with Clearwire. And then I think the other, um, you know, solution or kind of end game that's been discussed is, is potentially breaking up. T-Mobile and sort of piecemeal having different um, consortiums or companies take bits So, of so that, this is the key question, because you can't keep a player in the marketplace, just as you can't order specific performance of a, of a personal services contract. I mean, there's just there's just no way to do it. You can't say to T-Mobile, you've got to be there, because what really matters is not just having somebody there, it's making these staggering capital expenditures that are required to build out these networks. And if you look at CapEx expenditures in this country, right, and you, you just, across the private sector, it's Verizon and AT&T who stick out as, as the companies that have made staggering, I mean, just, they just dwarf everything else. And the point is, like, and this, this, is, this is why that, that DOJ letter matters. It's a recognition that you may not have five, four, maybe even three companies that are willing to do that. 
right? So, because that's what matters. What consumers want is companies that are willing to make those capital expenditures to keep innovating and developing new services so that you can take 4G from like six, six megabytes a second somewhere closer to its theoretical spec, which is 100 megabytes a second. That's what serves consumers in the end. You know, yeah. Verizon has made those capital expenditures to build out its, its LTE network to where it is today. AT&T has not. I, I also there's, no re there's nothing that prevents them from I, doing that, and it's not certainly not just this acquisition of T-Mobile. That is the only well, thing. Well, T-Mobile's not going to do it. On Thirty-nine time. billion dollars goes a long way towards uh, towards uh, building out a capital. Me Metro PCS capital. can't even raise the ten billion dollars it would need to buy the assets that that they would theoretically have carved out from this merger. Nobody's suggesting that every single player in the market has to build out, right? The question is whether or not there's going to be infrastructure there upon which other people can roam. Uh, and so the question is not whether you know Metro PCS and Cellular South are each going to build their own, are, are going to start like throwing up LTE or HD, you know HSPA uh, plus towers. All these network. tech terms. Just want to you guys want to explain uh, a, a, a not a LTE. Up, yeah, they, they don't have to throw <laughs> their own 4G towers in every single you know cellular market area just to just in order to make sure that we have. Uh, competitive services on 4G. I think, you know, in talking about the CapEx, we'd probably also be remiss if we didn't talk about the other sort of spectrum backdrop of this whole deal. So, Baron, you talked about the National Broadband Plan, um, and if, if folks aren't familiar with that, it is this sort of mammoth document that the FCC uh, you know, produced talking about uh, the need for more broadband deployment and broadband adoption within the United States. Um, significant discussion in there was about the need for more uh, commercial wireless broadband services, and there's a number of proposals in the document about sort of places that spectrum can come from, uh, one of which is through this sort of theory of incentive auctions, where the idea is that there are are some entities now, um, television broadcasters are among them, but it's not limited to television broadcasters, who are using Spectrum in a manner that uh, the FCC has said may be not as efficient as it could be, and there's this notion that if you could convince people who are currently using the Spectrum um, to give back some of it and then auction that off to people who really want it and can use it uh, in a different manner, that that would both create money for the Treasury and you know, sort of free up more Spectrum for new commercial wireless services. So you know, one sort of interesting piece here as we talk about you know what are companies willing to do? What do they have the money to do? What are they going to be building out? Is you know is there enough spectrum? Um, you know how do you look at AT and T and T Mobile sort of against the question of companies like Verizon saying there's not enough spectrum that's out there? Um, who would be the bidders in an auction if there were such an incentive auction and sort of those pieces too? So I think it's an important piece of the and, puzzle. And to put that more bluntly, government has created this problem. Government has grossly mismanaged spectrum, both in terms of wasting spectrum used by federal agencies and by the the, the clumsy and, al and, and outdated system by which Spectrum is allocated and, and essentially rigidly frozen in place. But they wrote the broadband plan, which you love. Well, well I, no, what I said is it's the best thing the FCC has produced. I didn't say I loved it. My, 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 my point about the, the reason the, broad, the, the broadband plan is a good plan is it recognizes that we are facing a crisis of, of, of shortage and that the shortage is, comes largely from government. And it comes, as I just mentioned, from those two things and from the fact that, that there is this staggering backlog across the country at the local level where municipalities have been sitting on, on uh, zoning applications to build more towers. And so the, these are the problems that need to be solved. Anyone else? What would you think of having uh, the government build the towers uh, like they built the interstate highway system and uh, then everybody... Uh, then have multiple companies uh, compete uh, to deliver the, uh, the well, services since, the same way we have truck lines. Since government now owns car companies and all these other things that you know we used to not do in a free market economy, I guess that's not crazy. Wait a minute. They, they built the interstate highway system so that we could have competitive uh, yeah. services. No, I mean, it's a, it's uh, a fair the, question. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to, yeah. to, to trivialize it. I, I, I guess my response is, A, would really genuinely – the problem isn't building more towers or funding them. The problem is getting the, the it's getting over the not in my backyard problem in municipalities. So having government finance the construction of towers doesn't solve that problem. The, the, the problem has to come in changing the way that we deal with those zoning uh, issues. And the, you know, places like Berkeley and the San Francisco area, right, have a terrible shortage of spectrum and terrible cell phone service because people just don't, don't want more towers because they think they're ugly or will cause cancer. I just want to make sure that we're, we're differentiating between a shortage of towers and a shortage of spectrum. 
right? Well, because these are two different. No, things. but no, but, but they're very closely related because the whole point is that spectrum. You, you can only make as much use of spectrum as you have towers. The greater the tower density, the more the more you efficiently and and aggressively you can use spectrum. So the two things are very closely linked. And the, and my point is that. The, those two things are the underlying problem that everybody here should be able to, to agree needs to be solved. And that, quite frankly, if that had been solved years ago, AT&T would probably not be buying T-Mobile. They would be spending their money buying more spectrum and building out more towers. And maybe, hopefully, T-Mobile would have been doing the same. But we're not in that world, and I'm sorry we're not. Okay. I, I want to be clear without so, making a fight that not everybody agrees that there's a spectrum crisis. <laughs> not, not opining on it. <laughs> not everybody agrees. Okay, we have a, a question in the back. Go ahead. Okay, so in both this debate and in the net neutrality debate, most of them last year, there seems to be this sharp dichotomy between wireless services versus landline services in terms of robbery allocation. And, I'm, and so the, the DOJ's own product market here is defining it as you know, wireless mobile communications. And I feel like that in and of itself may also be a problem. Because I think everyone here who's ever studied abroad or even has a long distance relationship like I do, we use Skype on our home computers with a landline connection, or we use Google Voice or whatever it is as a substitute for using a cell phone plan. And I think consumers are a lot more savvy about navigating that difference than than the DOJ is currently giving them. Would you switch away? Would you would you cancel your? Would you get rid of your mobile device if there were a? Uh, you know, a substantial non-transitory increase in the price of your plan. Um, That's the SNP right. test. I would lessen the data usage on it and transfer that over to my phone. Because, I mean, the question of, of, you know, but the question of whether, you know, whether or not people have an option to move away from an existing competitor or a competitor in, in you know, the, the post-merger market is a really big one, right? right? If, if I'm uh, an AT&T customer, and my uh, post merger, my bill goes up ten dollars a month. Am I going to switch over to Verizon? It sounds like an easy question, but then what happens? You know, if I once I realize that I'm going to get a new, I'm going to have to buy a new handset because of that, right? There are big switching costs in changing networks, especially when they use a different a different uh, technology, and then you get the coordination problem as well, which is if you have three or even four or five major major players in the market, you know, if maybe if I'm in a market where Metro PCS or Cellular South is a competitor, maybe not. Let's say I'm in a let's let's just make the case simple. Say I'm in a market where the three carriers I can choose from would be the post merger entity, uh, Verizon and Sprint. Um, I'm trying to make the decision whether or not to switch away, um, but as Verizon and Sprint see that AT&T or, or you know, the, the post-merger company has increased its prices, what prevents them from eventually raising their prices as well? Certainly they want to capture some churn uh, after, that initial, after that initial price raise. But beyond that, well, where, where is somebody going to go? But have you proven that? Like, I mean, this is a tight market where the spectrum efficiency like, is going to limit the number of markets in the field. We're never going to have 100 wireless providers, ever. And so unless you can demonstrate to me that it's it doesn't have to be clear that it, it doesn't have to be clear that there's going to be a massive raise in prices, right? The question is whether or not you're going to have a competitive market in which, uh, in which you're going to uh, reduce. Or in which, it's, 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 the question is whether or not you're going to have a competitive market post merger, whether or not a substantial uh, non-transitory increase in price is going to actually be, a, be sustainable. So, so Sherwin's right about the, the SNP test. I mean, that, 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 that's the way to bring analytical rigor to this. That's what I meant when I talked about econometric analysis before and what distinguishes this from the, um, the, the politics that goes on at the FCC. Um, but but I, I, I do want to say that um, uh, the question is not whether you'll have a competitive market after the merger. The question is whether the market will be um, more or less competitive to what it otherwise would have been, not compared to today, right? And that's where the uh, question about what T-Mobile might actually do um, uh, becomes important. Because if it's actually true that T-Mobile, without Deutsche Telekom's continual uh, capital expenditures, is going to fade away, then the market of tomorrow is going to look less competitive in some sense than the market of today anyway. And then the question is whether the, the, you know, the merger benefits people uh, in other respects. 
So but just we need to be careful here not to con to commit this uh, this fallacy. This is a variant of what's often called the nirvana fallacy, right? The nirvana fallacy is comparing, you know, what you actually are going to have to some unrealistic ideal, which might, in fact, just be today. So we've got to be careful about that and, and make sure that we're, we're, we're just, we're living in the world of, of betters, not perfects. And I just want to answer or respond a little bit to your question, minus the academic rigor, perhaps. Um, but, you know, the, the FCC, I think, has um, said right now that it doesn't find uh, you know, wireless and wireline to be perfect substitutes for each other. And you see that in something, for example, like you mentioned, the open Internet rules, right? There, there's a different treatment for wireless than there is for wireline. And, you know, that's intended, whether people might agree that that was the right policy cut or not, but it's intended to reflect, you know, differences in how mature those two services are. Um, so I think you find that the, that the FCC right now would not say um, that you know, wireless and wireline could be 100 percent substitutable for each other. But, but, but it is worth pointing out that the, the two things are merging. And we do, and I take your point, the point of your question to be that we have to be careful about thinking in terms of silos. And they're merging in, you know, on the margins in, in things like, just for example, you know, a clear 4G service, right? So I, I, I have a number of different options when I subscribe to clear, but one of them is that I can get a, a mobile uh, hotspot that I can use at home to power my home computers. I can take with me to power my laptop. So that, that's something that is bridging the gap between those two things. And similarly, at the same time, people here were talking about how this was, this was it, this was just the death of competition. Uh, wasn't it DISH that announced that they, uh, that their plans to build out a 4G network, I believe it was using um, the ancillary component to uh, satellite allocations. Point being that you know there are ways in which these these wireline wireless uh, silos are collapsing, and we're starting to see intermodal competition between those two modes. And 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 the other important one is that when I talked earlier about 4G being an important um, service, it's not just because I want Verizon and the the merged entity to compete with each other for mobile 4G. It's because this is right now faster than my home broadband connection, and so those services do compete with the home broadband service, even if the home broadband service is not a perfect substitute for the mobile service. And I just want to add one thing to that, which is that if you, if you believe that the wireless industry is sort of a competitor to the wireline industry, then one policy reason that you might not want to see T-Mobile acquired by AT&T is that uh, you know, Verizon and AT&T both obviously have wireline and wireless properties, and that impacts the way that they make certain policy arguments before the FCC. If T-Mobile then becomes a, a lost voice, a voice that's essentially acquired by an entity that has properties in both of those silos, then it becomes maybe a slightly different policy dynamic. Um, I heard a lot about um, data utility. You, somebody made a comment earlier about how services are offered by different um, competitors in the market. And there was a lot of talk this summer about um, data usage plans and how they're offered to consumers in terms of going from an unlimited uh, uh, platform to a pay-as-you-go type of platform and how that might inform spectrum um, efficiency or just the use of the spectrum as this merger was kind of coming around. I was wondering if you might just how that marketing tactic might inform um, the issues of spectrum that are going on in the wireless market industry. Uh, this is the connection to the net neutrality debate. You have to have some way to, to manage uh, uh, and prevent congestion on your networks. Um, and also to, uh, in particular, in the case of wireless, it's not just a question of congestion. It's to avoid having to make you know, another $10 billion a year in capital expenditures to build out extra capacity by giving consumers some, you know, either managing traffic on the network, which is what the net neutrality um, regulate, regulators were afraid of, or giving consumers some reason to themselves manage their consumption. And so, so the practical answer is that was going to happen because these the, the, the services are expensive to build out. And uh, the reality is that if you just uh, had a, an all-you-can-eat pricing system, you would end up seeing um, extremely uh, high-volume users who were watching Netflix on their tablet at Starbucks uh, being subsidized by people who were using their tablet for email. Indeed. So that's a marketplace response to uh, something that government, in some ways, you know, government's removing options from the table. So it's not surprising that that's the response. Well, it's funny because, I mean, it, you can also look at it from the point of, of whether or not um, those 
you know, whether or not you're actually seeing discriminatory actions based upon pricing plans, right? Would you be using that at your 4G connection as a substitute for home broadband if it was on a, a per byte basis? You certainly wouldn't be using it in the same way, and you wouldn't see the same sort of internet services built out on top of that if you had a pricing plan like that. Beyond that, if you, 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 know, the, the, you know, people say the power to tax is the power to destroy. Well, the power to bill for is also the power to limit, right? The, the, same, you know, the same frequencies that are carrying data are also, you know, are also going to be able to carry voice. The same pipes that carry data can also carry, will also carry cable TV. And how a, an internet service provider, who is also a cable company, decides to allocate the usage of those pipes is going to have a lot to do with how they want to charge how they want to charge for it. Um, if you know, I'm getting you know 500 channels of HD, you know, coming down over that pipe, and they're able to charge you know a set amount for that. If I can get that same amount of data, how much are they going to charge for me on that as as a broadband service, right? If I could you know for the same price get a download you know get get the get a fat download pipe. Uh, that has the same breadth as my as a cable TV connection for the same price that I pay for a cable TV connection. I won't need cable, right? I'll just watch Netflix all the time. But, but the, the, the problem is, this is just to come back to the DOJ letter. This is not lemonade stand economics. If you run a lemonade stand, it's really easy deciding how to price lemonade. Pricing here is really really hard, and and we lose. We often when we talk about innovation, we lose sight of the fact that most innovations are not about better technologies. They're about better ways to use technologies and better business models for bringing them forward. And that includes pricing. And, and that's a way of saying that, um, that if, you, if you take Sherwin's concern um, you know, too far, you wind up looking at all of this and, and what you, all you see is like they're just trying to screw consumers when in fact they're trying to figure out rational ways of pricing access to a resource that is really, really hard um, to decide how to price. There's no obvious answer as to how to do it. And so m my answer here is we need to let the marketplace play out because people are experimenting with ways to price this that, that don't end up resulting in A, congestion to the network, such as you see in, say, New York, if you ever try to use AT&T up there, and B, having to make huge and, and unnecessary capital expenditures because those, those expenditures end up getting passed back to the consumer in the form of higher prices. If we're talking about innovation, I think the, the question of what sort of innovation we want to see, the sort of innovation that we've seen over broadband uh, internet access has come on the applications layer. It's not coming in pricing structures. I mean, the, it, that's not the sort of innovation I think that we want to see it, it is, it, you know, isn't in pricing structures. There, you know, there might be some good things to come out of that. There might be some, some, some nice efficiencies to be gleaned from that. But when people talk about technology and innovation, it's really not about pricing structures. But so, it's also not fair to say you can only innovate on the edge. I mean, network providers are also capable of innovation. Oh, sure. But, well, but, but, but this, this is at the heart of the net neutrality debate, is that the, the people who want to regulate net neutrality discount uh, innovation at the core of the networks. And it's, it's exactly what Sherwin just said, which is all the innovation happens out there at the edge. I love that innovation. It's great. I spend my, 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 my life defending that innovation. Okay, But what, what, what was also just said is, is, is true, that innovation happens at the core of networks, and it's not just technological. The, the business model innovation is, is profoundly important. And just, just if I leave you with one message tonight, somebody like Steve Jobs, right, as remember, is a great innovator, not because Apple developed necessarily all these wonderful technologies, but because they figured out how to put them together and polish them and put them into packages that people would use, right? That's a broad metaphor for innovation, which is to say having the, the, the best widget isn't what's important. That's not what serves consumers. It's figuring out how to package that widget, price it in a way that, that actually makes it attractive to consumers relative to what they would otherwise have to spend for all that upstream capital investment. Is it in, in the interests of innovators at the core of the network to allow innovation at the edge that would compete with, with their business models? I think the, the, the example of Ma Bell is instructive, right? For the longest time, you weren't allowed to connect somebody else's phone to their network. Yeah, well, government built that monster. Uh, <laughs> it did. It absolutely did. If you read Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch, it's a wonderful history of how government creates all these problems. And then in the end, the solution is more government, 
which is, is this weird whoa, whoa. double thing. So well, it's, it's not a weird double thing because the, the existing policy was to allow a heavily regulated but a single private monopoly. Which was built by government. And then government changed its mind and said, well, we want competition. But, but, but look, the, 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 so, the, I mean, this, this is essentially the debate. Yes, this comes down to you what you do about that information just as much empires. That law is the problem. You could say that telecom companies are the problem. The, but if you, if you want to abstract it that far. No, the, the, the lesson here, to my mind, is to avoid uh, industrial planning, which is, is easier to fall into than you might think. And industrial planning happens when you do things like banning or limiting innovation in business models. Right? That's how government ends up building uh, incumbents that, that downstream are very difficult to dislodge and also slowing innovation in things like building out 4G and the next, the next uh, generation of broadband services. But, you're, you're, but your concern is, is with, you know, with Okay, traditional. guys, sorry, I don't want <laughs> I don't want to, I know you guys are very into your debate. Um, I just want to see if there are any, I can take one last question and then I think we're probably going to wrap up. I'm sure you're probably... Got, you've gotten the full gist of this <laughs> transaction. <laughs> okay, so I'll just turn to the panelists and see if anybody has any last closing statements. I'm going to give you like two minutes. Don't want to, <laughs> and then if no one ha does, anyone have anything else you want to say? Well, the, the, the only thing we didn't really get to talk about was the maverick theory. So this is at the core of the DOJ's argument. Uh, the idea that a firm is a maverick is a term of art in antitrust. It means that they have a particular uh, form of pricing. Um, T-Mobile is not a maverick. It just it does not fit the, the traditional theory. So this idea that somehow the merger is removing a maverick from the marketplace that was fundamentally changing and putting uh, pressure on, on AT&T and um, and T-Mobile is just not true. If you look carefully at what T-Mobile does, it, what it actually reveals is that they're in fact their pricing is not because they're a maverick, it's because they themselves are competing heavily with Metro PCS and US Cellular, the number five and six carriers, as well as with smaller carriers around the country. So I think this is a fundamental weakness in, in the government's case and something that in fact reveals that the market is more competitive and that the market definition should be larger. Okay. I guess I'd simply say that I think this is this is a closer case than sometimes is seen in the media. That uh, the government could lose this case uh, very easily. It's uh, and it's it'll be an interesting case to watch uh, for all the reasons we've talked about tonight. And I have to say that I'm surprised that nobody's asked the question about what happens at the FCC with the uh, DOJ case being filed. But since you haven't asked, I won't tell you. <laughs> I wanted to kind of, that, that would be a great way, I think, to kind of close because that was something that I actually had on my list of questions, but because of the timing, I didn't want, I wanted to give people a chance to ask. But I mean, I think that's one of the things is, is there any formal coordination between the DOJ and FCC regarding this? And how is it likely to impact the FCC? What do you think in terms of since the DOJ has already kind of made their assessment? I mean, the FCC hasn't really said much on what's happening there. I mean, I know at the last, I guess, they asked for more documents. They've gotten them. And there was some discussion recently about job, their claim, the claim on creation of jobs. But um, if you. Right, so as a general matter in transactions, there is close coordination between the agencies. Um, they either share documents or uh, when one of the agencies sees documents that the other agency has asked for, they would say, uh, as the FCC did recently, hey, whatever you guys are producing for the DOJ litigation, you know, we want that too. Um, so they do coordinate closely. Um, often, but not always, decisions will be made uh, or issued around the same time. It tends to happen, I think, more with approvals than with um, transactions that are not approved. They tend to happen you know, fairly closely chronologically to each other. Uh, in this case, um, you know, as we said initially, separate reviews uh, from the FCC and the DOJ. So in some ways, the fact that the DOJ has brought suit means absolutely nothing for the FCC's review of the transaction. Um, several of the commissioners issued statements on the day that the FCC, uh, that the the DOJ announced its lawsuit and said, you know, okay, but we have our own independent review process. Uh, as a practical matter, um, you know, I, I think that everybody can probably imagine that it's a, a bit unthinkable that the FCC would not in some way be impacted by what's happening with the Department of Justice. Um, we don't know exactly where the FCC's review is going, um, and we certainly don't know what the timing looks like. Um, the FCC could reach a decision sooner. It could reach a decision later. It could wait until the court rules. It could, uh, you know, proceed what the court does, you know, bearing in mind that if the court supports um, DOJ, it won't 
matter what the FCC does because that'll be the answer. Um, if the companies win against DOJ, then they still wouldn't be able to close absent FCC approval. Um, so, so really, in some ways, DOJ has set itself up as kind of the place where the action is because the FCC won't truly be relevant until we know what that outcome is. Well, I just want to thank you guys so much for coming out and sharing this information for us. It was very, very lively and informative panel. And if you're right, you could just give them a quick round of applause. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>